returning to Aaron, we see two videos posted on r slash breadtube. One about how capitalism stole the internet, which is going to be presumably one of those surface level red tube videos that talks about everything we already know. Advertising is way overblown on the internet and it's causing the internet to go into bad ways. It's messing up search engines. Search engine optimization is messing all, everything up, that sort of thing. Fine. And then one called, Does Donald Trump Even Want to be President? by one renegade cut. <laughs> all right. So I'm just going to give a brief experience that I had with a video of Renegade Cut, and it's just to show you how you should be careful around what these people are saying. In my personal work, I'm doing a lot of work on a video game, and I often uh, write on my books and this sort of thing. So my point is I have lengthy periods where I'm doing something and I'll have a video on in the background and it'll typically be a YouTube video. So I see Renegade Cut's Seinfeld review in my feed and I think, eh, why the heck not? Seinfeld is kind of an okay show sometimes and you know, I need some time to kill so why not? I'll look at what this guy has to say about Seinfeld. At first it begins innocuously with going through the characters and their characteristics and a little bit oddly, he rates them by their morality, whether he thinks that they're good or bad people. They have an odd way to view that if you know about the show. But then, partway through the Seinfeld review, he stopped for an extended period of time to talk about how Seinfeld handles the police. Now, if this had just been a joke about, oh, haha, Seinfeld has dumb police well of course seinfeld has dumb police seinfeld is going to either have dumb, dumb police or extremely gung-ho police because everyone in St seinfeld is a stereotype of some kind your taxi driver is a stereotype the guy who manages the parking lot is a stereotype the moms and dads are stereotypes just everyone's going to be a stereotype the most well-known example of the cop who's massively way too intense in Seinfeld is the library cop who is library cop goes and hounds uh, Seinfeld for just this one random book they had over the years and they had gone and paid off its fine for having and just uh, funny stuff, right? But Rank Cut then goes and says, oh, actually, the police weren't handled badly enough because they didn't go and take every opportunity to go and mock them to go and say they're stupid that we shouldn't have police and at this point I'm like oh boy so it's, he's one of these guys that I've apparently clicked on to yep so yep he's a bread tuber apparently and someone that people in bread tube post on constantly and this is absolutely no surprise so uh, his discussion on police was absolutely surface level and boiled down to, I don't like police, they're bad, and so I want to see them mocked all the time in media, blah dee blah dee blah dee blah dee blah Just really generic, basic bitch stuff, right? But here's the thing. As a person, and especially as someone who is a younger person, perhaps, who has been introduced to this person via bread tube, they can just go and listen to that and then go and absorb anything without critically thinking and weighing what's actually being said, which is an absurdity. You're ranting about how a sitcom went and dealt with a subject that a sitcom could not possibly go and deal with adequately. Um, to talk about policing and its merits and drawbacks in modern day society, you need an extremely philosophical presentation and if you're going to go and argue against police you're going to go and have to argue for what we replace police with and it better be something that can go and deal with gangs and then has a consistent presence i suppose you could go and if you're anarchic say well maybe everyone should have something of the rights of a police officer i just hope you're comfortable then with everyone having equally distributed weapons if you're going to go with that. See, here's the thing. Police, you might not know this if you're just going and going and spending all of your time on r slash ACAB, 
but police do have training to go and arrest people, which they go and put into use. And this is a very specific issue that requires talents of itself. A lot of policing is technical. Conducting an investigation is a very technical thing. These, of course, are things that people who just generically hate police don't even go and consider. And by the way, I myself, for the record, not even a big fan of how modern day policing is done. I think that it's far too abstracted from the community that's a part of. And I oftentimes see police that are appointed. And so again, not democratically elected. They're being appointed by mayoral boards and the police that are being appointed may or may, may not actually be liked by the general populace. So there are just issues like that that we encounter in modern day policing. But I'll just conclude this brief section with this. Don't outsource your thoughts to BreadTube, okay? They do surface level commentary. It sounds good. It sounds like what a whole bunch of people online are saying at this time. They focus on very basic topics and give them surface level and they're just trying to go and get you to think, oh, I'm an elite because I go and follow BreadTube and oh, I'm an interacting with ideas that have some weight or merit. Well, really, no, no. This isn't what BreadTube is about. BreadTube is about basic bitch essays on pop culture and doing a lousy job at that and then going and giving you a lousy political education as well. And they're just thankful that you never learned reason in your primary and high school and even in your university because that way is the only way that you can go and actually trust what they're saying to you. But don't worry, I'm teaching you reason right here. So now you're going to be able to go away with individualized thoughts of your own. We then see Aaron post a Star Wars meme on a subreddit called r slash holy prequel memes where he has Obi-Wan face palming to the text when you meet a devout Christian who's anti-immigrant. And of course, this being a reference presumably to Jesus at one point having been a refugee in Egypt after King Herod uh, allegedly slaughtered all the infants in Bethlehem and the surrounding regions. By the way, this didn't actually historically happen. It's... <laughs> um, I don't want to get into the hyper specifics of um, what the Herodian dynasty was, but let's just say that they were Edomite converts to Judaism, which means they were having to be extremely strict and careful about how they were going around ruling over the Jews underneath them. And the Jews underneath them would have definitely been really angry if King Herod had gone and had a bunch of Jewish infants massacred, so did not happen. Also, it was a client kingdom of Rome, and they probably have raised a couple of eyebrows at him doing that at that time. So, anyways, more importantly, around what Aaron is talking about, remember, Aaron at this point is hyper anti capitalist. He hates bosses, he hates all of the capitalist framework in society, and yet he continuously uses corporate media references. In this case, he's referencing Star Wars, which is like the super mega king of corporate media. Star Wars screwed over its artistic merit to go and become a kidified, demified franchise that can be commercially marketed inoffensively to almost everyone. And so whenever you look at Star Wars stuff now, it's like you see Darth Vader and that character is so, so far from what he was in the movies, right? He's like this pop cultural icon that everyone's always like, oh, he's this supreme dark lord. And in the movies, honestly, really a very uh, basic generic archetype, right? They tried to do something a little bit different with him and the prequels didn't, didn't really work. But uh, so the thing is, though, Star Wars, more than any other franchise, defined corporate media and the path it would take. Corporate merchandising. Isn't to say that it didn't produce some good stuff during that merchandising blitz. Yes, there were some fun games and that sort of thing. But just overall, that, yeah, just a deluge of merchandising crap. And it unfortunately infected almost all of the pop culture franchises with that. So... 
Anyways, that's Star Wars for you. Importantly, in 2023, Aaron would make his first foray into another subreddit that would become one of his favorites, r slash ACAB, all cops are bastards. So we talked earlier about r slash dank left being an extremist subreddit. r slash ACAB, probably one of the most extremist promoting subreddits on Reddit itself. It's a Reddit that constantly goes and promotes an anti-police attitude and it engages in dehumanization of police. You, you literally just know it in the banner there, right? It's portraying police as a, a pig. And this is how r slash ACAB describes itself. Description, all cops, well buddy, they're bastards. And in Aaron's post on this, he was promoting a video by one of his favorite YouTubers that was promoting the Stop Cop City movement. The Stop Cop City movement, for those who are unaware, is a movement in the U.S. by um, a group of anarchists. And the idea is they want to go and abolish all of the police in the areas that they're in. Because, remember, at the fundamental core, these sorts of anarchists very often devolve into basically ideological gangs where they want to go and be able to cause as much mayhem and as much chaos and as much property damage as possible. They want to go and be able to go and loot whatever corporate stores that they want. They want to go and be able to beat up anyone who goes and stands in their way with an absolute impunity. All, all ideas that you'll know are essentially the ideas behind a social elite, how the absolute brats of a social elite would act. You can imagine a bunch of like the Sons of Knights in the old medieval times, maybe going into a village and saying, oh, we're the Sons of Knights, we're untouchables, and then they go and beat up a bunch of the peasant men. Well, this is the idea behind these anarchists, especially given that a lot of these anarchist types go and come from upper class backgrounds, from upper middle class backgrounds. So and this is how you should view them. And this is also, by the way, why a lot of them are constantly getting off of the charges because they're parents who are rich and wealthy and socially privileged can go and get their kids off despite the fact that their kids are constantly doing these absolutely awful things in society. So just remember that these anarchists are very much the social elites that they claim to hate. And this is how general society views them from their absolutely crappy graffiti that they use to go and destroy publicly owned places without any sort of democratic consensus to doing that. So of course, individual over the community, exact opposite of what they promote, but it is what they practice in reality. And so this is a foray into extremism and it's a foray that we're going to constantly see from this point on. We have another post in Relationship Anarchy where he cross posts a meme from r slash destroy work that was originally titled no boss, no state, no God. And it's a picture of graffiti that says, no God, no boss, no husband, no state. And Aaron Cross posted it with this title, no gods, no husbands. So once more, an absolute elitist in his relationship views, this whole idea that, oh, most women in society have husbands. Well, that's stupid. Well we're better than that we're an elite in our thoughts we're anarchists we're so much better than that and so let's look at this though so no gods well you know what a lot of cultures well a lot i say basically every culture on the planet conceived of gods at some point so you could say that oh that's stupid and foolish and whatever else you want to say nor me but the reality is that they did that for a very specific cultural reason. They attached these gods to different psychological traits of their societies. They were important to them. Having a consistent partner, whether a woman calls her, uh, her partner a uh, husband or not, whether you like the idea of the state being involved in marriage or not, you can argue whether there is validity to the state being involved in marriage. I've um, oftentimes myself said that it's likely not a particularly valid thing and that per partnerships might be a better general idea. But the point being that 
to say then that a woman who calls a man her husband is now suddenly stupid and that she shouldn't be doing that well just because some sort of anarchist goes and sprays graffiti somewhere again it's hyper elitist hyper elitist and we're we see this all the time too right these movements that claim oh we're for the people we're for the people we're for the people and what they do they constantly talk about ways to go and screw over the people to go and take ideas that people love and then to go and destroy them just another sign that he's not a good thinker he's a weak thinker and despite being a weak thinker he is a self-convinced elitist thinker we see a cross post from him in r slash acab about the austerity measures in paris and the police response to the riots around that of course he's taking the side of the rioters I do remember as he starts to post in r slash acab that he's a member of the u.s air force and despite this he's going to go and loathe every part of america hierarchies police military all that but he's still an active u.s air force service member so when people try and tell you that he is a was a convinced and dedicated soldier no absolutely not aaron is the exact opposite he is not a convinced soldier he is someone who deeply 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 at this point regrets that he ever signed that dotted line he regrets ever becoming a soldier we see a brief post on r slash bread tube about native american causes and oh, another thing don't ever <laughs> gosh bread tube on um native americans or just any of these sorts of left fling guys on native americans i absolutely um I'll be very, very, very careful about that, people. Um, go, honestly, Native American folklore, really, really good. Go and look it up. Go find out what it's actually about. You're going to go and enjoy it a lot. It's like, it's a real throwback to before the time when your culture probably got its mind screwed with by absolutist religion. It's really good psychologically. But these guys that insist on twisting it and turning it their way, not good, not good. Just briefly there yep hawaiians got absolutely screwed over when the u.s went and annexed hawaii so important point to it, if you're living in hawaii you should probably recognize that but also if you're living in hawaii and thinking that way do also recognize that you're currently living in a place that is i believe 95 percent non-hawaiian so just um do your best do your best and this is one of the challenges that you're going to face in a post colonial era of doing the right thing for people and also having to deal with the fact that there are a bunch of um, other people living in those sorts of areas so just do what's good for the native hawaiians if you can please all right another post from r slash bread tube from renegade cut again oh boy this time advocating for graffiti so of course the anarchist who is obviously talking about community and how people should throw together and be more tribalistic and be hyper interlinked together is of course going to go and have the hyper individualist action of going and spraying graffiti on public spaces and going and desecrating that so that you force the entire public to go and look at what you've sprayed on there and then just go and thumb your noses out and say oh i'm look at me i'm enlightened i can do whatever i want yep Again, acting like an entire entailed elitist. Yep. So people who rant about hierarchies then give themselves the right to go and do whatever they want on the basis of them being a superior ideology to other people. Which you'll also remember, by the way, the trait of religion in Western society, and by that I mean Christianity and Islam, that's what they did. They went and gave themselves the right to go and treat others as they wanted because they were part of a very specific ideology. It led to a lot of crap around the world. It led to a lot of dehumanizing of other people. It's not a good idea. Don't promote it. And, and don't come here telling me that you're an anti-fascist if you're going to be an absolutist. If you're going to be an absolutist, you're not anti-fascist. You're a modified version 
of the absolute mindset that fascism has. And a mindset, by the way, that a form of absolutism and authoritarianism is going to share. It's very simple. He posts a video on utilitarianism and tagged as featuring an anime character. Corporate media again. In stand-up shots, he would post a meme of a transgender comedian that tied into his newfound ACAB obsession titled, It's funny because ACAB, all cops are bastards. And this is what the meme says. Everyone assumes that trans women want to go into women's sports because we want to beat up women. If that were true, we wouldn't have transitioned. We'd have become cops. <sighs> Right. He then inserts himself into more drama between the African American left YouTubers and BreadTube, posting a topic from SB Signifier and Lil Bill that calls out BreadTube for its alleged whiteness problem. It will be noted shortly after that Aaron Bushnell will strongly come to despise whiteness and have strong reactions against that term. So, again, once more moving very much with the cultural patterns of the time. I should note that I've also seen cases of red tube being recommended for topics like this by actual schools even actual universities Ugh, just absolutely hor horrible and perhaps uh, maybe this is why uh, kids have absolutely horrible uh, reasoning skills nowadays and just buy into whatever the mob crowd wants to say uh, we have another appropriate meme in r slash dank left titled no lords no bosses so once more pop culture meme again here uh, corporate meme in r slash anti-fascist subreddit he would cross post a post showing graffiti of the house of an anti-transgender utah senator with the title a spade has been labeled a spade so again this is something that's hyper emphasized amongst the anarchist community and as i've already speculated i believe that Aaron is perhaps having some ideas about going and transitioning. We'll perhaps see a bit more evidence of that later on. And here's the problem that we now enter into, okay? The recorded data from 2023, as I talked about earlier, is not good. It's quite bad, actually, because Reddit went and changed its API, so archive sites are having a very difficult time going and archiving it. Incidentally, if you want to know why that happened, we found out recently that Reddit has signed a deal with ChatGPT, the company behind that, OpenAI, to go and use the posts and topics on Reddit to go and put into its chatbots, then come up with replies to various topics and information on various topics. So. Essentially, it was an entirely corporate move. But what it does is, just like Twitter, it goes and with Twitter, for those who don't know, also has the same thing going on, where you now can't go and archive tweets from various accounts. So what this does, though, is that it prevents us from recovering information, including information that might have been deleted, which is important. In the case of Twitter, it means that you can go and grab a screenshot from someone, but it also goes and gives them culpable deniability to just go and delete that and then say you're lying because you can't archive it. So this is not good for the internet, these things that are happening. It gives us, uh, us independent researchers who are actually willing to go and sift through all this stuff. It makes our job a lot harder. And of course, Reddit, to start with having this sort of reaction to Aaron and going and wiping out almost all of his posts, this in itself was a awful thing to do for archival purposes. I would much rather have seen us be able to go and recover everything that he said in a detailed manner, but this was not what was done. Instead, we've now got information that's been very much suppressed and hidden because these companies absolutely hate the idea of being involved in any sort of scandal which is why we see these sorts of extreme reactions to go and 
bury these accounts immediately once we get these people. So we see this off also with anyone who's a mass shooter. Well, we should have their account information to know what they were talking about before they went on and did those acts. But instead, what's happened is that these companies immediately go and absolutely clean house. They go and delete every post that they made. They go and delete the account. So we're left with basically fragments if we even get those. And going forward, those fragments are going to be much more difficult to even acquire. We also have another problem here, which is that from this period onwards, Aaron is going to, to much less become a direct poster. He's much more going to be a reply person. And what that's going to do is it's going to mean that we're going to be further hindered in our attempt to reconstruct his post history because all of the textual replies they did were basically wiped out. So this is just the unfortunate realities going forward. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and start dealing with just the general nature of the topics that he's interacted with. So um, just because Aaron's post on a topic got deleted does not mean that the post topic itself would have been deleted or even interestingly enough, people who replied to him. So if he's on a post and someone has replied to what he has said, well, we can then go and get that person's reply and then kind of contextualize what Aaron might have said. The point is though, that this is just going to be the way it goes forward in our investigation here. But do keep with me because we are still going to have posts that directly have what Aaron said. Like I said, there were a few subreddits that were very important ones like r slash ACAB that did keep Aaron's posts around long enough so that I could go and get them. And also we still have his videos and the occasional memes that he posted as titles at this time. So we are still going to have a lot of stuff coming up here. So at this point in our investigation, we are about 10 months before the death of Aaron. And here's where we'll start to see some very significant elements related to our primary topic, which is how did Aaron view uh, Palestine at the time of its death? And fortunately, this is one of those topics that has been very, very, very caught up in that deletion of Aaron's posts and replies that I was talking about. But here we have the first recorded promotion of the Palestinian cause, which is him posting a video on r slash breadtube promoting a anti-Israel protest in Leicester, UK. So interesting. And incidentally, I just want to briefly say that I really think that his primary purpose for using breadtube is that he likes the subreddit more as a place where he views that he can go in and radicalize people. They can go and convince them to go farther left. Essentially, he takes upon himself the persona of a missionary, just like his parents and his church growing up would have glorified. And you'll note that this is just one of the many religious hangovers that he has, including, importantly, the trait that his friends would later note of being motivated by guilt, primarily to go and commit to actions. And so uh, we'll get to that. More significantly even than the start of his pro-Palestinian activism is a post in r slash anarchy for everyone entitled Teku, tagged anti-colonialist. So this is a post that Aaron has posted in the subreddit. And Keku, for those unaware, is online lingo for laughing. Let's look into this post. We find that Aaron Bushnell, an active duty U.S. Air Force serviceman, is celebrating the crash of a U.S. military F-16 fighter jet in South Korea. And he's taking that as anti-colonialism. Fortunately, in this case, the pilot was able to bail out but really just shows how warped and anti-American Aaron Bushnell's psychology has become. He now actively celebrates anything that hurts America and considers the U.S. as a colonial power. And a reminder, the U.S. 
is an anti-colonial power. The U.S. let go after World War II of its largest colony, its largest territory, which it inherited from the Spanish Empire, and this was the Philippines. The Philippines in the modern day has something crazy like 80 to 100 million people in it. This is not a small country to go and allow to become independent. The U.S. has also said that if Puerto Rico decides that it wants to go and be independent, it can go and do that. This is actually a consistent rule that the U.S. has for its territories. The U.S. is not a colonial power. It inherited colonies from a previous colonial power by defeating that power, specifically the Spanish Empire. So when you say that the U.S. is colonizing these different areas, well, it has military bases in certain areas. That is not the action of a colonizer. The Korean military is vastly more powerful than the U.S. military in Korea. If the South Korean army wanted to, it could easily toss out any U.S. soldier within the country. Actually, if South Korea just doesn't even have to do that, South Korea could just say, we want all the U.S. soldiers in the country to go and leave, and the U.S. would do that. they go and give up the military base, and they go and leave. Now, why does South Korea not want that to happen? Because the U.S. has advanced weapons stationed in South Korea that serve as countermeasures to the aggression of North Korea and China against the people of South Korea. North Korea wants to go in and conquer South Korea. For that purpose, they built nuclear weapons that can go and annihilate the South Korean cities. The countermeasure is that the U.S. has nuclear weapons that can go and annihilate the North Korean cities. Additionally, the U.S. has stealth aircraft, which means they could go in and actively destroy those nuclear weapons in North Korea before they even got a chance to activate in a, a military situation. So South Korea wants the U.S. military to be in their country and to have those sorts of capabilities. And what's more, just remember that just because a country has a military base, it oftentimes means that the people there typically agree to having that military base. Like there was a reason why the U.S. soldiers were in South Korea during the Cold War. It was to go and act as a force between the two Koreas that prevented active hostilities from emerging again. So if the U.S. soldiers can go and act as a barrier troop, well, that means that then North Korea doesn't just have to commit to attacking South Korea. It now has to commit to attacking the U.S. itself. And that's a much more dangerous proposition than going in and attacking South Korea. Incidentally, North Korea attacking South Korea would still result in a North Korean defeat because the North Korean army is absolute crap, like just absolute crap, whereas South Korea is one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world with one of the most intelligent citizens in the world would absolutely smash the North Koreans. The North Koreans' only hope would be to draw in the Chinese, and if they draw in the Chinese at that point, we're in uh, World War III. So do the, the Chinese really want to go and die for uh, the sake of North Korea, which is already a crappy little stupid country that should never have existed? Uh, of course they don't. We have another sort of transgender themed post in r slash trans clones. I really have a subreddit for everything nowadays, um, which is apparently a Reddit devoted to posting transgender themed Star Wars prequel memes. All right. Well, you know, subgenre for everyone, right? Subgenre for everyone. Um, and in this post, presumably he was castigating Target for removing LGBTQ merchandise with the others in the thread. He then interacted with people in r slash Air Force talking about the military demoting a two-star general to a colonel after committing a sex crime that got him fined. So what happened here is that the judge initially in the trial went and fined the 
uh, general, and then the Secretary of the Air Force stepped in and forced the demotion. And then basically, if you read into it, the Secretary forced the general to go and retire as well. But still, the general was allowed to go and retire with an honorable discharge compared to, for example, if he gone out on an actually hardcore sexual charge that would make it an dishonorable discharge. The issue is that Aaron took this post and then posted it to r slash ACAB, all cops are bastard, with the title, all military are bad, with the additional bracketed note of TWSA standing for trigger warning sexual assault. This is the highest ranking U.S. Air Force officer to ever be court-martialed. He was a major general, a.k.a. an 08, a.k.a. the third highest rank in the Air Force. He was committed of sexually assaulting his sister-in-law, and his punishment is to be demoted by two ranks and allowed to retire, with an 06 pension that most people can only dream of. For those who don't know, the U.S. military has a quasi-feudal structure with an explicitly internal class system. Enlisted and officers have different pay schedules and ranks. Enlisted do the work while officers command, do paperwork, and move money around. The most junior officer outranks the most senior enlisted. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how high up this man is. He was an 08 and his judge was an 06. She found him not guilty of two of three counts and sentenced him to a fucking fine. The Secretary of the Air Force added the demotion. He asked to retire and is being allowed to do so with full benefits. He just has to take the retirement pay of an 06. That's it. Okay, so let's break this down though. In our system of law, there are people who go and look into matters that involve crimes and crimes that have potentially been committed. These people do thorough investigations and they're not perfect, but generally speaking, especially with investigations that have a very high public focus on them, they typically go and do as good a job as they can. So in saying that, we have to be quite careful here. The nature of the sexual assault in question is obviously not a severe sexual assault. And by that, I mean rape and all that sort of thing. As for the nature of what that sexual assault entailed, there are a wide number of things that are classified as sexual assault so that can be anything from exposing yourself to another person to going and feeling them up or making them uncomfortable or trying to go and force them into a sexual relationship there's just a ton of things that can be regarded as sexual assault i will also have to note that it is a woman who is presiding over this trial so very typically women will be more sympathetic. A wide variety of penalties have to be applied to a concept that has a wide variety of potentially things that are classified under it. So for example, if a man exposes himself to a woman and solicits her for sex and makes her feel uncomfortable, uh, that has to merit a fine of a certain amount if a man goes and forcefully grabs a woman and then goes and physically starts to go and sexually assault her that way, that has to go and have a more severe penalty. And so to say that it got reduced down to a fine with several of the counts thrown out means that it was likely a more minor form of what is classified as sexual assault. Again, this makes the general a jerk and the reality is that the Secretary of the Air Force stepped in, demoted the guy, and then basically told them to go and screw off. So that person is now out of the Air Force. He had the honorable discharge. He is not in a place anymore where he can go and potentially exercise authority to go and commit sexual abuse. He is retired. He no longer matters in society, and he has also been publicly exposed and humiliated. So the point is, this is involved about as major oversight as is possible in the US. You may not have agreed with all of the conclusions of what happened here, but what I'm just going to say is that this was 
about as public and as transparent and as open as a trial could be. You can hate the result. I have not looked into this trial myself to go and see what exactly the accusations were and all that, but frankly, I am guessing your average person on r slash ACAT isn't actually doing that sort of hardcore work. And instead they're just going and saying, oh, the system goes and favors these people, blah, blah, blah. When the reality is that the system usually goes and has corrective measures and the secretary of the Air Force, he was the one who put in place that corrective measure. We then have another post in r slash ACOB talking about the trial of Greg Capers. Now, Greg Capers was in a unfortunate situation where he was conducting a raid on a house and he shot and wounded a child who came out of a room, an 11 year old child. This is a very bad situation, but the child did survive. So it's worth pointing that out. And Greg Capers was acquitted by a jury who found that he acted on mistake and not malice. Greg Capers also said, of course, that he does not hate children, that he does not have malicious intent. And it's one of those situations where to just go and say that this happened and that Greg Capers is a person of evil intent, that he is a man who has malicious intent, is not something that you can go and just make that sort of judgment. The reality is that uh, police shooting innocent people, it does happen. A lot of the reasons that this does happen is that police have inadequate training or they are too trigger happy or nervous in this sort of situation. Keeping in mind, of course, that the police in the US are vastly more likely to run into people who have guns than elsewhere in the world, which is, of course, something that people elsewhere in the world who are constantly talking and bashing American police oftentimes seem to forget. Your life can be ended very, very quickly if you get into a firefight, and so people are oftentimes very trigger happy. So as far as what is happening with Greg Capers, presumably he's either been put out of the service or he is being forced to undergo a lot more training. So presumably an entirely new course on his police training. And of course, in this post, Aaron says, except for pigs, replying to another uh, user. And the general idea is that they're saying that, oh, pigs can come in any shade and any color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, more dehumanizing language directed against police and government officials, corporate leaders, managers, landowners, just a whole bunch of other stuff. Posted again in another transgender topic on r slash union. University and college union votes to stand with trans people. Trans rights are human rights. He then posted twice in a topic on r slash anti-fascists of Reddit about the verdict of an Antifa trial. And I believe this was the trial where anarchists were undergoing a RICO organized crime act conviction. So basically that's the RICO was put in place so that the FBI had a way of dealing with the mafia. That's the sort of organized crime that we're talking about. And the anarchist gangs got hit with that. There were like 65 of them or something that got arrested for that. So point being, these are gang organizations that just happen to have an ideology to make their uh, uh, members act fanatically and um, be okay with committing almost any sort of antisocial acts. And these gangs go and are run off of drug money, which I'll remind you for the record that drugs in America are acquired from the cartels in Central America and South America. And those cartels are engaging in mass slaughter of Hispanic people in those areas. They're just, mur they're murdering them. They're torturing them. If you've ever seen what these cartels have done in video form, it is absolutely brutal. These are the sorts of people that these anarchists are acquiring their drugs from. So they're, again, very despicable people, very evil-minded people, and they just have an ideology that tells them that only they're right in the world and that thus they're 
entirely justified in their actions because typical society is hateful and bigoted and blah 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 just a bunch of crap to go and justify themselves acting like uh, complete jerks I get to r slash star wars lefty memes and he posted the meme i don't even need to change the text you get it the original cross-posted meme was about charlie and the chocolate factory but aaron has changed the context to an anti-joe biden meme clearly so once more ranting about liberalism democrats oh the voting process is rigged and we can't go and get any candidates in because apparently the people have been brainwashed so that they don't want the sort of person who goes and spends their weekends spraying graffiti and chanting death to America in public office. Big surprise. Nine months before his death, he posted a response to a topic in r slash ACAB titled Fascism is Here. And in his response, he said, In America, being a patriot is not different than being a fascist. To which another user replied, same in Germany, but I find it more sickening looking back at German history. So again, hates everything to do with America, hates the concept of America, hates any talk of being a patriot or liking America. He's not a soldier or an American citizen at heart. He's someone who is a seditionist at heart, who absolutely hates America. And this just goes to show you how these subreddits are engaged in mass radicalization. They do not get called out for it. I'm going to call them out right here. So if anyone's listening, r slash ACAB is a radicalizing group. They're going to be found responsible. I have no doubt in the future for having inspired a bunch of people to go out and kill cops and to go and act like anarchic jackasses in society. Absolutely what they are. And they should be treated as such. And frankly, given what we've seen about the way that these foreign authoritarian regimes have been infiltrating politics, it would not surprise me whatsoever to know that these sort of subreddits are controlled by people who have been supplied with outside money to go and discredit the Western cops and then to go and basically spread chaos in Western society. That's what they want. They want people to go and be angsty and miserable and constantly at each other's throats and politicized and ideologically polarized. This is the tactic that these regimes have chosen to inflict upon the Western world. And this is what we're helping to cure in discussions like this. And if I can just be even a small part of that, I will be happy. We have a crossover that will become more relevant after Aaron's death as Cornell West, a radical leftist activist and thinker, announced his presidential run. This was posted in r slash ACAB by another user who titled it, May I present the presidential candidate against police brutality? And to this post, Aaron responds, All politicians are bad. U.S. presidents are straight up not human. So there you have it. Aaron hates the voting process to the point where he's engaged in active dehumanization of all U.S. presidents. We see more hatred of police and his response to another user's post on r slash ACAB titled, What happened between the 70s and now for so many poor, rural, blue-collar people to back the blue? I grew up with Vanishing Point, Smokey and the Bandit, BJ and the Bear, Dukes of Hazard, etc., where cops were the overreaching, vengeful, bastard villains. Aaron then replies with a post full of the buzzword brain rot terminology he learned from BreadTube. It's nice to have media where cops happen to be the villains, but I would venture to guess that those shows were not actually critical of the fundamental nature of policing. It probably actually reinforced settler colonial culture, which ultimately plays into cops' hands. The U.S. has done a very good job of integrating a certain false revolutionary spirit, which tropes of rebellious white male rogues play into. So not only does he hate police, he thinks that the US impulse to freedom is a false revolutionary spirit. This is because he is a perfectionist about his anarchy. You could say, looking at the US, that it is a rejection of the previous social aristocratic hierarchies of Europe. 
you can say whatever you like about how much influence you think that companies or merchants had back then in the U.S., but it was a rejection of the social hierarchy that was prevalent in Europe. So it is not a fake impulse to freedom. It is a real impulse to freedom, and it carries with it some baggage. That's what we can say. But if you're a perfectionist, that doesn't matter. If it has baggage, it means it must be rejected. It's worthless. River, this is exactly what Aaron would have been taught in his Christian circles, right? They say that anyone else could go and do good works and that sort of thing, but they're not done from a Christian perspective. They're basically worthless. So it's a very fanatical idea, and it's the idea that reality and people's actions in reality is only valid insofar as those people are acting according to the interpretive ideology that is overlaid on reality. What happens is that it is not the action itself that is important. What becomes important is the ideology behind that action, the reason why it is undertaken and performed. What this does eventually is that you get to a point where, as a matter of fact, the action is not what's important. What's important is simply that you are doing something for the sake of an ideology. So you could do something much lesser for the sake of an ideology and the ideologue would still go, that's much better than this other thing that this other person did. So go look at what the founding fathers did in America. They overthrew imperial control of an empire, right? And then look at what anarchists do. They spray graffiti around, but they want to go and say, oh, we're so much better than the founding fathers. The founding fathers are fake. They have fake impulses to freedom. And yet here are people who have accomplished things that are way more important, way better than anything that the anarchists have ever done. And so this is the consequence of perfectionist ideals. What starts out as claimed perfectionism actually ends up going and being an argument for ideological mediocrity, for mediocre art, mediocre culture, mediocre social systems, mediocre everything. But if that mediocre is done for the sake of the ideology, that is reckoned as being better. So this is why you see all of this obsessive fanaticism about so many of these ideas. And to anyone listening, it should be obvious that this is such a false way of looking at reality. If you look at reality as though it has to be something that is hyper-interpreted instead of something that has a story to itself, a story that has a flowing continuity, well then of course you're going to go for these fake perfectionist ideals. We continue with his posts about Israel. And this one is from four months before his death. He replied to a post about Israel in r slash smug ideology man entitled, Oh God, they're going to make us watch, aren't they? This post explicitly accused Israel of committing a genocide and having an apartheid state. And we don't know what Aaron said, but it doesn't take too much to imagine what he would have replied to it given his track record. He posted in a thread on r slash anarchy for everyone that claimed that the mainstream media has a double standard about Palestine and Ukraine. I'm going to tell you briefly why this is wrong. For starters, Ukraine was objectively attacked by Russia first in 2014 when the Russians sent over a bunch of subversive agents to go and create a so-called people's revolution in all of these occupied areas and then uh, went and outright annexed Crimea under fake election conditions. And then in 2022, again, when they went and outright invaded Ukraine. And this has always been an aggressive attack with the purpose of annexing Ukraine into Russia. It is not, as they initially talked about, uh, a campaign for freedom of the Russian-speaking population of Ukraine. Well, the reality is that about... 75 to 80 percent of ukrainians speak russian as their native language so th there is no russian and ukrainian ethnic groups in ukraine it's that's a false dichotomy based upon 
a linguistic difference which does not actually exist. I mean that in the sense that Ukraine has its own language, but simply because of the influence of the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire before it, Ukrainian is simply not a very spoken language in Ukraine. So even Zelensky, for example, his native tongue is Russian. So this is something, of course, that people who talk about Ukraine wanting to go and exterminate Russian from their country, they never go and actually look at the realities on the ground about this. That's one of the hip hypocritical things about this so-called mainstream media double standard. Israel, of course, was attacked by Hamas on October 7th. The war with Hamas has been ongoing for years and years, decades. So Israel, in case you didn't know, occupied the Gaza Strip up to about 2005, and then they went and withdrew from the Gaza Strip. Okay, so you have that in your mind. The reason they withdrew was because they agreed that the Palestinians would have their own little country in that area. And so the issue has been that ever since then, there's been flare-ups in the violence. So there's been rocket attacks on Israel, there's been responses from Israel, there's been kidnappings, etc. The problem is that when you go and look at the sort of massive operation that Hamas launched on October 7th, that was an outright invasion. And remember, these are from people who say that Palestine is its own country, okay? So if a country goes and launches an open attack on another country and then goes and massacres 1,400 people in that country, any country would respond to that. They would be required legally to go and respond to that. But here we have this hypocrisy where people say, oh, Palestine is its own country, but we're not going to go and give it the consequences of a country. We're just going to go and keep pretending like it doesn't have its own government. It doesn't have its own military force, right? So in Gaza, Hamas had between 30,000 and 40,000 soldiers at the start of the uh, Gaza-Israel war. It ha now is substantially less, of course, because of the combat operations that have been taking place. But that's a major problem. So right there, there is a hypocritical way that Palestine is treated in the mainstream media. It's not treated like a country. It's treated like this weird pseudo territory of Israel, despite the fact that it's self-governing. It has its own military. It often has conflicts with Israel. So just a very weird way of taking it. And let's go and take this another step. The mainstream media was full of people who are shooting off article after article about how much they despised Ukraine before the recent flare-up of conflict in 2022. This was because a lot of them sympathized directly with the various republics in the Donbass. So specifically, they sympathized intensely with that Donetsk Republic, which has a whole ton of communist symbolism associated with it. And so they were taking that and they were going looking at it and there's this bunch of old leftists in Europe, a bunch of you know, fossils essentially from the Cold War or who had mentors from that Cold War era. And they were all looking at it and going, oh, we like this Donetsk Republic. We want to go and support it. Let's go and give a whole bunch of accolades to it. And then we'll go and claim that Ukraine is full of neo-Nazis and blah de blah de blah Meanwhile, obviously, Russia is a heavily irredentious country. They're going and trying to go and annex a whole bunch of territory. They want to go and have every single person that they identify as of the Rus ethnicity under their banner. This is stuff that is outright Hitlerism in practice. And the mainstream media in many publications has taken Hamas's word at face value about casualty numbers, about what's been going on in Gaza, even as their word is constantly disproven and they're not a reliable source. In a lot of cases, this is not because, oh, Hamas is so reliable. Oh, these people that they have as so-called journalists in those areas are reliable. This is extensively driven by the fact that a lot of journalists today are hyper-politicized, very much anti-Western in their outlook. 
Some have been bribed by ch Russian, Chinese, Qatari money. And a lot of them are just plain ideologues. And so they have no problems with going and manipulating data, manipulating the sort of stories that they run, going and putting misleading headlines out there, going and putting headlines as though they're speaking the absolute truth about something when you look at into the article and they admit that it's oh, with this speculation. So there's a lot of ways that the media will screw with your heads. And this is not to say that this is the media considered in its entirety or even a lot of these organizations in their entirety, but it is saying that there's a lot of corrupt elements all throughout the Western media. Now let's talk about the tactics. Ukraine doesn't carry out civilian reprisals. Russia in that war is bombing civilian centers nonstop. They're shooting off rockets at civilian centers. They're hitting hospitals, maternity wards, schools, uh, apartment complexes, hotels, marketplaces. They've hit all of these things with missiles and drones. Just terrible, terrible ways. And they're not doing this targeted in a lot of times a lot of the times they're just firing these things off sporadically with only a vague sense of where they're going to go and land so this is a terror tactic this is uh, a tactic that we saw constantly throughout uh, various wars where you just go and bomb civilians non-stop you go and hit their centers just randomly don't care the point is to cause fear and terror that is what russia does and then ukraine in contrast, they go and attack targets that are very specific. So they'll go and attack military bases. They'll go and attack naval ships. They'll go and strike at industrial facilities. These are the things that they're targeting. So the facilities that go and supply the munitions and fuel and all that sort of thing for the war. They'll go and target the barracks and uh, military outposts the naval bases and naval ships. And these are what you would expect from a force that is conducting its war in accordance with the modern day Western doctrines. Whereas Russia is conducting a war extremely hypocritically and terroristically. And meanwhile, what Russia does is it just goes and puts out a bunch of alternative reality propaganda that goes and claims that, oh, Ukraine was bombing civilians nonstop in our uh, associated republics that we had to go step in in 2022 and then you go and look at the actual statistics from the UN about that and then you find out that there were only like under 50 casualties a year in that low intensity conflict and a lot of those were on the Ukrainian side since the forces that were associated with Russia of course had their same sort of doctrinal tactics so they don't care where their artillery shells are landing and all this sort of mess so that's just to say that always remember that there's going to be a extreme amount of hypocrisy coming from these sorts of authoritarian regimes and they're going to go and lie a lot. And then we're talking about Israel now. So the hard thing that's always going to go about Israel is that the issue is they're in a situation of urban warfare and a bit worse than that, even it's urban warfare where a lot of the civilians for various reasons have not gone out of that urban setting, which means that you're going to go and have casualties in that sort of situation. You're going to have substantial casualties from civilians because you're conducting military operations in an urban environment. Hamas, of course, has extensive tunnel systems beneath the various cities of Gaza, and these are where they're facilities and their production facilities are located. This is where most of their troops are currently. And so the problem is that these tunnel systems are intertwined with civilian infrastructure. And there's also been a lot of other things. So Hamas, for example, oftentimes they don't use any sort of identifiable military uniform. They just go and attack with wearing civilian clothing to seem like they're blending in. These are big, big problems. And remember, if you're in a firefight, your life can end very, very, very quickly. It doesn't matter if you have armor on. There's stuff that can happen even with as much protection as you can be given in an urban conflict setting. 
all this is to say that you have to remember that it is Hamas ultimately who decide to go and start this war. They're the ones that decide to go and fight inside of these cities. Israel did what it could to go and evacuate the citizens of Palestine to go to various other places while they're conducting this war against Hamas. And it is a reminder against Hamas. It is not against the Palestinians as a people. The Palestinians as a people are divided between the Gaza Palestinians and the West Bank Palestinians, and the West Bank is not currently under attack. All right. So if Israel was going and attacking all of the Palestinians with the intention of going and annexing their land or whatever else you want to go and call it, then of course they would have sent a bunch of military forces into the West Bank. And the West Bank, incidentally, that would have gone them massive condemnation from all the different countries around the world, and they would not have received support for that. So the reason that they received support in this Gaza operation is because Israel was the one who was attacked by Hamas. And of course, let's also mention that why Hamas did this. Hamas attacked Israel because this was a greater plan with the Russians and the Iranians in particular. Now, what they want to do is the Middle East at present is largely speaking, sort of on the side of the Western countries as a general rule. This is not a entire thing. There are countries that have um, split loyalties or lean more towards that sort of Russia, China, Iran sort of nexus. But the point is that what Hamas did is that they went and attacked Israel and the idea was they're going to go and inflict such massive casualties, such massive civilian casualties on Israel that Israel is going to be forced to go and have a heavy-handed response to them. So they managed to go and provoke that. So automatically, we have to point out that they had no chance of winning that operation whatsoever by simply performing that attack. Hamas, once more, is 30,000 to 40,000 infantry that are light infantry. They don't have uh, military vehicles to go and use but besides like cars and uh, that sort of thing, but they don't have armored military vehicles. They don't have an air force. They have some drones that we've seen, but point is they're very ill-equipped for any sort of war against a modern military such as Israel's. So the plan was that they were going to go into Israel. They were going to conduct the massacre, and then the idea is that while Hamas is then going and videotaping what's happening to the citizens in Gaza, they're then going to go and try and garner as much sympathy as they can from the Middle Eastern countries. If they can go and provoke the Middle Eastern countries into attacking Israel, that would be considered a win from their perspective. If they can't do that, then what they can go do which is what Russia and Iran are primarily uh, thinking about, is that they can go and shift the sympathies in the Middle Eastern countries away from the Western countries towards the Russia-Iran-China nexus. And this is also what they want to do inside of the Western countries themselves. So, of course, the Western countries have accepted a lot of Islamic immigrants from the Middle East and Furthermore, we have an entire slew of uh, leftists in the universities, and these two groups combined together can go and put on a lot of demonstrations. They're still, I would say, a very small minority, but they're a very loud vocal minority and one that is also very violent in their tendencies. And thus far, just because of the way that politics has worked, these groups have been very much coddled, even as they're conducting very violent acts a lot of the time. And you see this where we have people who are calling now for death to the Jews in the streets and they're going and attacking synagogues. And these sorts of things where they're being conducted by other groups would have been already heavily suppressed. But the issue is that because they're being conducted by these very specific groups, well, we have to go and factor in that certain people feel like they've got an alliance and that they're reliant upon these groups for a large part of their votes. Again, this is another reason why this whole uh, representative democracy thing is really 
uh, has a lot of issues to it where you're starting to rely on <laughs> extremist groups to go and make up your uh, voting margins. That's a very, very bad situation to be in. Very bad. So some people have, of course, recognized that that's an issue. Some people have seen that, oh, maybe if we move away from these sorts of fanatical groups, go center ourselves a bit more, then we can go and start pulling in a lot of the moderate people, which way outnumber these sort of extremists, including, by the way, generally speaking, the uh, Muslims. So the extremist Muslims are a very, they're a minority within the Muslim community as a whole, which is something that, of course, you oftentimes don't actually see because people have this absurd tendency to go and say that, oh, we're going to go and paint Muslims with a broad brush. So somehow you then get the <laughs> this, you know, the absolute far right knuckle head sort of um, Muslims that want to go and promote all this you know, stuff about, oh, the West is degenerate and blah de blah de blah and then they get stuck in with the moderate Muslims and then a sort of uh, people who are going and talking about those knuckle-headed types are then going and saying, oh, this, you know, we're going to treat them like they're, if the, as if they're attacking these moderate Muslims that just want to go and live their lives and, you know, just have this uh, cultural sort of religion about them, which, you know, it's, it's an absurd uh, combination, but it's once more also because there's certain parts of our society, certain parts of our political apparatus that are oftentimes hyper allergic to making value judgments is what I would say. And so they just accept people as they're labeled and then they go and make judgments from there, despite the fact that you should be able to go and make value judgments. But these people are very much um, very immature in their thought. So which is all just to say, comparing the Palestinians and the Ukrainians absolutely false and saying that the mainstream media is biased is again some people in the mainstream media have their biases and I will say that a lot of them those biases happen to be with the Palestinians and the Russians it's just you're going to see it more with people being pro-Palestinian because you can actually say that in Western countries whereas with the pro-Russian part they're very quiet about how they frame that so there's still lots of people who are pro-Russian and you'll know that by the sort of stories, the way they frame the headlines. But they can't go and outright say that, oh, I'm pro-Putin and I want the Russians to go and win. They have to be quiet about that. In art slash ACAB, the question was asked whether ACAB only includes cops in non-socialist countries. To which the response was that 48% were against cops in all situations. 34.2% were not against socialist cops, and the remainder were mixed. It is here that we see that Aaron is actually going to align himself with that 48%, so he is very anarchic in that sense. He does not want cops in any sort of situations, even if they're cops that would have a uh, left-wing tendency. And his statement was that they were always bad, because the organization of cops and police is based on violent enforcement of the social order. I got into another argument with a, another user over that position. Here's another weird Star Wars meme posted on r slash anarchy for everyone titled Earth Peace, the forgiveness of the Sith. I have lost war, slavery, injustice, and danger to my old anarchy. Your old anarchy? Don't really get it either, but all right. In r slash ACAB, a user asked whether there were any good places to move to that don't have police. Aaron replied that if you can learn to speak Spanish, maybe a Zapatista community would take you in. And of course, this is a complete misunderstanding of the way that the Zapatista movement works. But anyways. He posted on two threads relevant to the Israel-Palestine conflict. One was in r slash late stage colonialism entitled, Are Human Rights Really Universal? Palestine and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 75 Years Later. The second was in r slash dank left titled, I still don't know how people could support Israel when its officials keep calling Palestinians that. And this showed a meme stating, 
me hearing someone from across the room refer to Palestinian people as human animals. Just once again, taking something that is very anormative and then blowing it much out of proportion. But once more, these sorts of people love to do that. It's one of the dishonest patterns that we're seeing with them. And for the record, I mean, let's be real here. Like, <laughs> the supporters of Hamas have called Jews tons of things. Like, Jews have been called devils and all this sort of thing. So, let's not talk about this. Like, it's just one side doing it. We have two more cases of Aaron promoting slash commenting on gender identity topics with him presumably signing with Chelsea Manning in a reply he made on r slash pe people's calendar. Of course, very interesting that they're choosing to glorify Chelsea Manning because, of course, Chelsea Manning is very much in with the whole Russia line group. And yeah, perhaps a bit of an indicator that we've got some stuff here going on here in Reddit that might be worth check into and later he posted replies in r slash late stage colonialism and r slash iww on israel palestine issues including a topic that suggests israel is losing the war and this is approximately two months before his death we have another two re replies from him in r slash anarchy for everyone in a topic titled marriage reproduces class hierarchies so it's more going on about standard relationships in society. Then, then on a thread in r slash breadtube titled South African Lawyers Incredible Speech Accusing Israel of Genocide at the International Criminal Court. Not a video essay, but I mean, this is your bread and butter. Fuck genocide. So that, of course, suit that South Africa, which is, of course, one of the key countries of BRICS, specifically their outpost in Africa, accusing Israel of genocide. South Africa, you should also know that, of course, those, um, uh, the ANC party, of course, very, very corrupt political party now. Uh, they, they've been allowed to ride on the coattails of ending apartheid, but then their politicians all became corrupt and have since gone and basically run the country very poorly and they keep trying to tell people that they should just vote for them because of apartheid, you know, even though the conditions that would have led to apartheid are, of course, obviously gone now. So there's just a bunch of people who are parasitically living off of a legacy and being pro-Russia and pro-China and pro-Iran while they're doing it. So, yeah, that's the thing. There's a meme on r slash Workers Strike Back that Aaron commented on, titled, Liberals, when you tell them to look up Project Gladio, NATO is a fascist organization. Again, more brainwashing from a voluntary association of countries that are designed to go and stop other bigger countries from imperialistically invading smaller countries. All right. But of course, that's what makes you a fascist, according to these morons. Aaron's most major remaining post on the subject of the Israel-Palestine conflict is from a response he made to the user the Dark Ram 1996 in r anti-fascists of Red. So this is going to be very key to understanding his general philosophy around the Israel and Palestine and how he views the Israel and Hamas conflict. This is the most major remaining post from uh, the period that we can go and access. And so let's go and look at it right now. First up, I'm going to talk about and uh, give you the comment of the Dark Ram 1996, where he was talking about why he didn't feel like people should go and support Hamas because he says Hamas is a far right organization. He's not being pro Israel here, he is just going and saying, well, maybe we shouldn't go and support Hamas since you know, it's also bad. So this is what he says. I don't think we should be rooting for an Islamo-fascist that is Hamas. And we should really tell the difference between Palestinian liberation and literally fucking Hamas. Like, I feel we're really missing the whole point about all of this. Both the Israeli and Palestinian governments and leadership is led by theocratic fascists. 
On one side is the neo-Zionist apartheid state that desires creating a greater nation by using the example of the Nazi oppressors decades ago. And on the other is a psychotic religious Islamist death cult that want to start the second Holocaust and finish the work of Adolf Hitler. The real victims is the civilians on the ground, both Jews and Palestinians, the victims of rape, the hostages, and the people that is murdered because of individuals in positions of power is using the concept of liberation as a way to cover up any of the true intentions they really have, and it is genocide. And it's very disheartening to see that even people make them out to be. The conflict is essentially fascists against fascists. There needs to be a ceasefire, but only that has to happen if Hamas in Palestine and the far right, especially Netanyahu in Israel, is out of the equation, out of power completely. This post was generally positively received by Vote Karma with plus 43, but generated some controversy in the replies. Aaron posted the following response. You are badly misframing reality. He then quotes the Dark Ram. And on the other is a psychotic religious Islamist death cult that wants to start a second Holocaust and finish the work of Adolf Hitler. Aaron continues, No, on the other side is the Palestinian people. Why do you frame an entire colonized people the way the imperial powers tell you to? It is so racist. Israel is waging war on the Palestinian people. This video is vaguely positive toward armed resistance against that, and you say, why are we ruining for Hamas? You're regurgitating the classic racist liberal framing of this genocide and all colonial wars. Wow, this colonial project looks an awful lot like fascism. It's too bad that the colonized people are evil, so we can't support them fighting back. Wake up and learn about the reality of Palestinian struggle. Don't fucking sit here in the Imperial Corps calling Palestinians Hamas and Hamas Nazis. You'll note that he's an apologist for Hamas here, explicitly framing the conflict in ways that minimize the instigators and leaders of it, and also whitewashing their extreme religio-fascistic outlook. He also frames the war as a total war against the Palestinian people, despite the Palestinians in the West Bank not being attacked and Israel constantly saying that it's at war with Hamas, not against the normal Palestinians. He also notably identifies the West as the Imperial Core, and also goes on a rant against liberalism. And once again, this is what he thought two months before his death. In our slashed Lost Generation, he replied to an anarchist-themed post titled, Fighting against oppression is always justified, even if it does get violent. This post has a screenshot of Oscar BLM, with one of those long string of numbers after the username that is usually indicative of a Twitter bot. Oscar BLM stated, To those of you who say violence is never the answer, how do you think black people won the civil rights movement? Our grandparents saying kung baya until the Senate felt guilty? Was the Stonewall Riots nothing more than a jolly stroll through the streets? It's interesting to note that we've also reconstructed a post from Aaron from r slash smug ideology man titled, Beware of Suspiciously Innocuous Self Summaries. I acquired the text from this post from a user on Destiny's Reddit and I've been able to verify the surrounding details in their entirety. Aaron's Reddit post was unfortunately removed before I could look at the text myself, but I've been able to verify all the context around it. This includes the fact that Aaron made the two posts on this thread, received the contextually accurate responses from the user, and the fact that Aaron's posts line up entirely with the Reddit karma that we can see. I would also say that this is the sort of response that he would make at the time, given that he is a very intense sort of anarchist who distrusts and hates all government, in particular anyone who is associated with the West. And what this post will show is that Aaron's anti-Western attitudes have begun to affect how he saw global conflicts, including conflicts that he previously supported, such as the Ukrainian people against the Russians. And so now, he has begun to take an anti-Ukrainian perspective on the Russo-Ukrainian war, despite Russia allegedly 
being almost everything he is against. So conscription, an extremely authoritarian government, all these things. Of course, these sorts of anarchists, they never go and apply what they're saying consistent. They, they never go and have the same sort of standard for these countries that they have for the Western countries where every little violation of their ideology suddenly now means that, oh, the Western countries are fascist dictatorships. Oh, and meanwhile, we have all these countries in the authoritarian bloc that have leaders that are single leaders with dictatorial power, North Korea, Iran, Russia, China. And yet these people go and give them a pass simply because they're opposed to the West. So absolutely hypocritical, absolutely an example of a intensive double standard and a double standard, of course, that those authoritarian countries want people to look at them through. So let's talk about what happened in this thread. The user Big Plastic Dildo Maker said, you aren't a tanky for calling out US war crimes. You're a tanky for using them to say, see, America has no right to defend Ukraine. Aaron then replies, America isn't defending Ukraine, if by Ukraine you mean the Ukrainian people. America is competing with Russia for control of the Ukrainian state. A big plastic dildo maker replies, by giving the Ukrainian people weapons to defend themselves with? Aaron replies, they aren't giving them to the Ukrainian people. Why would they do that? They're giving them to the Ukrainian state. Gazlor then replies, except that many Ukrainian citizens, especially at the start of the war, fought of their own volition against the Russian invasion, because they do not, in fact, want to join the fascist Russian state. And Big Dil Plastic Dildo Maker replies to Aaron, okay. So, of course, what we're seeing here is that Aaron has adopted the Russian way of looking at the world, this Russian-China-Iranian apparatus, which is everywhere is under the control of one empire or the other. So Ukraine isn't its own independent state. Ukraine would be a occupied client state of the American Western Empire. And that's all they would be. And so when you're looking at the conflict, oh, you're not looking at Russia versus Ukraine. You're looking at Russia versus the American Empire. Of course, absolutely false. Just because a country is allied with another one does not, in fact, mean that it is a client state of that other country. But remember, this is how Russia runs its client states. So Belarus is not an independent country. It is a client country of Russia that is influenced in almost everything it does by Russia. Russia can go and phone up the president of Belarus, Lukashenko, and tell him to go do something, and he will go and do it. Whether that means going and giving uh, Russia a bunch of their leftover military equipment or going and uh, allowing Russian troops on their soil, etc., etc. Russia, of course, also nowadays has, I believe, nuclear weapons stationed in Belarus. So they've, of course, upped the ante of stationing nuclear weapons much closer to the Western borders. So next time you hear Putin talking about, oh, provocation, provocations, well, remember, he's the one who's engaging all these provocations and blathering on about hitting people with nuclear weapons all the time. And this is the way of looking at the world that these people on the far left have adopted. They have gone and said, oh, everywhere is going to be a part of an empire. We're going to go and consider everywhere as part of an empire. And that's how we're going to go and look at them. So it removes any sort of viable willpower from the Ukrainians to just go and say, oh, they're now... Uh, just doing whatever the U.S. wants them to do, whatever the U.S. tells them to do. Of course, nobody in Ukraine is fighting for the sake of joining the American empire. What Ukraine has talked about is joining the European Union, a bloc that, as a matter of fact, was formed largely to have a major voice in the West. They'd have the collective power that would be likely in excess of the power of the U.S. in a lot of ways certainly in uh, some ways like education, Europe is far ahead. Europe even has a substantially higher number of people in it than the U.S. U.S. has what you would say as a better sort of resource count, a better uh, geopolitical position. 
But point is that Europe does have a lot of advantages if you consider it as a collective body, and that's what Ukraine wants to go and consider joining. And of course, NATO, well, we've already seen why Ukraine wants to join NATO. It's because they want to go and avoid Russia going and steamrolling into their country. If, if those Baltic states hadn't been a part of NATO, is there any doubt that Putin would have just steamrolled into them like he did with Ukraine? Putin didn't care about what the international reaction to that Ukraine invasion was. He just wanted to go and get in there, conquer them as fast as possible, and then go and plant his flag and say, you know, what are you going to say about it? I already control your oil because you're corrupt politicians in the uh, various places of Europe, like the Merkels and that have gone and sold you out to me, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to go and purposefully shoot your industry in the foot so that you can go and make a moral point now that I have control of Ukraine. You're going to do nothing. You know, I'm going to go and rule this. I'm going to go and act however I want. And of course, Ukraine went and threw a major spanner in that, uh, that wheel. And so now Putin's stuck in a very bad situation. He's mired down in a war that he claimed would be over in three days. He wanted a three-day special military operation. He's a sort of stubborn bastard, so he won't even call it a war. He still continues to call it a special military operation, even after his side has suffered hundreds of thousands of casualties. So just a lot of ridiculousness from uh, that side. Uh, of course, some ridiculousness from Europe for not stepping in and buying into Putin's nuclear blackmail instead of going and helping Ukraine and driving Russia out. So, uh, especially given now that people are talking about, oh, we're probably going to have to go in now and potentially send troops to Ukraine. So, uh, good job there. Instead of just going and blunting that initial invasion force, you might have to go and face off against whatever he's got cooking now. We then get several posts about whiteness from Aaron. The first were several removed posts in r slash anarchism where he was supporting a video titled Anti-Whiteness is Good Actually. This all started when he posted a video from the African-American left YouTuber named Philo Sinoir. And that video has the following description. Anti-Whiteness is Good Actually. No, really. This video is about anti-whiteness as it ties into race abolition. Race abolition is a movement referred to by many as the new abolition, as arguments that are extremely compelling. I'll mainly cover Noel Ignatiev's work, but I'll also cover Karen Fields and Barbara J. Fields, Racecraft, and some Peter Galderloos as well. The video's goal is to give you a good grasp on anti-whiteness and why it's needed to abolish race and why we should consider abolishing race at all. Most importantly, this video is about why you, assumed white reader, need to, be con need to consider becoming a race traitor. And the video additionally has a part entitled Zionism and White Supremacy. So of course, a lot of very provocative language being used there, race traitor specifically, But what you have to remember is that for the contemporary population, they're going to hear that and they're going to assume that means, well, basically it, they're going to say that means anyone from the European area, the area around Europe, perhaps expanding out to include a few other groups, depending on how those groups might want to view them. So the point is that in society, generally speaking, there's very much an idea of what white means and of course uh, once once i let aaron have his little talk here i'm gonna go and give you my what i have to say about whiteness so i'll go and get you sort of set up about how you should go and look at the issues with race in the modern day and that sort of thing but so there's two other things though that we have to consider here so first up Whiteness is, we have to remember that for these left-wing groups, the most important factor in society and how they view society is not realities. So 
there is a reality to an ethnic group that is oftentimes not present in what is considered as race. But the problem is that they're viewing society in terms of social constructs, in terms of these abstract ideas. And the issue is that they're going to apply the ideas behind this idea of abolishing whiteness to you, whether or not you believe in race and whether you believe in white race or etc, etc, etc. The issue is that when they go and put these ideas into practice, you're getting hammered with them no matter what you believe in, no matter what you yourself practice. And this is where the biggest issue comes in because this is always a very hypocritical thing. So if you're going to go and argue that something doesn't exist, that something is a fiction, then you would go and treat it as a fiction. But here we have the issue that a lot of these people are treating things which are essentially being presented as social fictions and then they're going and arranging reality around these social fictions. So just as a general note here, I'll, I'll go and talk about the proof for this layer, but in the contemporary way that we look at the world, there's no such thing as a white race. There's no such thing as an Asian race. There's no such thing as a Native American race. There's no such thing as a black race. The reality is that all of these things have been constructed by how people viewed very surface level way of looking at them. So people who have characteristics that appear physically similar, they're going and getting classified in a certain way, despite the fact that the genetic realities behind that are oftentimes simply not there. And so this is what the scientific sort of perspective on it is, but we're interacting with ideas that are not scientific. So what happened is that Aaron posted that video and then got a very mixed response to it. And he was very angry about that. And so a second thread followed after that first thread on the same subreddit and it was titled what does whiteness mean to you? And this was posted by another person. And Aaron replied to that user saying, you're more stalwart person than I for leading this discussion. My stomach hurts just reading the top comments here and on the original thread. So obviously this is a topic that was very emotional for him, that was very attached to, and he very much hated the response they was getting on that other thread. What's more, Aaron is the sort of person who does not take well to being questioned, to arguing with other people online, it seems. I know some of his friends talked about how they would have conversations about various different topics and then uh, they would butt heads over that. Um, seemingly, perhaps not to the sort of extent that they that was happening online, as we can see here. Regardless, a user named Idnum, apparently a self-described anarcho-communist, replied to Aaron, Since I actually want to learn, could you please explain to me what the issue is with my comments specifically? Really, I think the topic of the video could have been gone across better if it just said, Abolishing whiteness is good actually, which probably would have led to less knee-jerk reactions. Aaron did not take this concept well. He didn't take this critique of him well. And so he responded with his longest post that we're going to go over describing his views on whiteness. Too long didn't read at the bottom. So overall your thesis is that the title is intentionally provocative and thus leads to provocation for good and for ill. And that is the case of this angsty won't someone think of the optics response on the original post? This is essentially respectability politics with all of its fallacies. It posits that the way that advocates and educators often marginalize people speaking about their own oppression, as in this case, talk about social issues determines whether people listen or are reactionary, which is at best only a very tiny bit true. This leads to tone policing, as happened here, where usually white people respond to usually 
BIPOC speaking about their own oppression by saying they would really like to listen if only the BIPOC in question would be more polite or make their message a little easier on white ears. Your comments try very hard to make this argument sound reasonable, and so doing, lay bare its rationality. From the beginning of your comment, you argue, I think the issue is that the title doesn't come across as being against whiteness as a concept, but rather against white people. Going back to Aaron, at the risk of staying the obvious, the title said whiteness, not white people. So we're starting from a place of saying that people misread the title, but blaming that on the title. Also, another thing that should be pushed back against in this extremely white framing caused by the extremely white response to this video is the implicit assertion that white people need to be protected from anti-white people sentiment. The worst possibility here being propped up as a legitimate fear that needs to be assaged is that an oppressed group of people might have a callous attitudes towards their oppressors. Like that's it. That's the boogeyman in the room here. A tough look for so-called anarchists. Anyway, back to critiquing your argument. The best suggestion you can come up with is changing anti-whiteness to abolish whiteness or whiteness to the myth of whiteness or not using the is good actually meme because somehow that is what's making people misinterpret the word whiteness. These are very subtle variations that do not change the meaning of the title. They state the same thing slightly differently. But somehow these slight word variations are what's responsible for the backlash to the video. Even if we accept that slightly optimized wordplay may have circumvented white people's insecurities better, the central problem still remains white people's insecurities. To blame the black person who made the video as responsible for white people's reactionary reaction because they failed to be a master manipulator in titling their video is fundamentally wrong. The reason your comment on this post is so upsetting to me is because this post is a perfect opportunity to talk about and work on that white insecurity. The OP framed the issue very generously, openly, and empathetically while still centering the conversation around whiteness. This is something I thought anarchists would be hungry to engage in. Just as a side note, I don't know, should anarchists be obsessed over racial politics? I mean, should they really? Just seems bizarre to me. Anyways, we'll continue with Aaron. But instead, your comment shoots to the top immediately and explicitly recentering the conversation around the wording of the title of the video, just like happened on the original post. I realized while writing this that this conversation is very analogous to the From the River to the Sea discourse. Most anarchists wouldn't, I hope, blame that slogan for causing Zionist backlash because it fails to go out of its way to reassure colonizers that they would be safe in a free Palestine. That's absurd. Anyone hearing that phrase and thinking it means Jewish genocide is misinterpreting it because of other massive issues inherent to themselves from broader society, not anything inherent to the slogan. Maybe a differently worded slogan would cause less backlash. Maybe. Probably not. That's how reactionism works. But would do so by avoiding the problem, which is Zionist fragility. Again, I also have to point out here, Zionist fragility. There were wars that Jews won in Israel where the Arab countries had a 12 to 1 advantage over them. That's not fragility. <laughs> like this whole, oh, we need to be protected at all costs and have our message amplified by the media and we need to go and have this and that, blah, blah, blah. And that's, that's more the sign of fragility that I'm looking at. And it's a lot more coming from the Hamas side, especially because once more they're losing and once Hamas finds itself out of power, well then that's the end of its organization. TLDR, failing to assuage white people's insecurities is not the cause of white insecurities. Whiteness needs to be abolished and trying to appease people who choose to identify their personhood with whiteness is an endlessly losing battle. To recenter conversations intended to criticize whiteness around nitpicking the tone of anti-whiteness is to get in way of the solution and to be a part of the problem.
so that's what Aaron had to say about whiteness. You'll note, and this is very important here, that he is constantly talking about this term whiteness, 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 whiteness. He constantly talks about white people. This is not someone who is just critiquing a concept and talking about, oh, it's something that doesn't exist. You know, white ears, for example, what that little piece they said about white ears, and that part about treating BIPOC like it's somehow a actual identity, like just also bizarre uh, because BIPOC is once more, that is vastly more of a social construct than even these racial categories that we're going to be talking about in a moment. That is something that doesn't exist, like just labeling everyone as being uh, colored people, you know, just because you're what people identify as Asian or Hispanic or black. These are groups that have vastly different uh, understandings of society, vastly different ways of going about things. That being the peoples that and uh, ethnic groups that people usually associate with said race. So let's get into talking about whiteness then. I talked to you before about the issues with going and uh, having society operating around these sorts of racial classifications when the idea is that the racial classification is seen as non-existent but you're still going to treat it as an existence because people think it exists. And so this is constantly what you see in the left wing. It's produced a sort of backlash on the uh, right wing where the right wing now is constantly talking about white people this, white people that, white Americans, you know, so on, so on, so on, white European people. And the problem is that all of these are based upon social fictions they're not based upon reality so we need to ground ourselves first very explicitly the specific concept of there being genetic lineages and uh, peoples and ethnic groups that have those lineages and have a shared culture these things are accurate they're just not going to be accurate in the sense that they correspond to what we currently think of and imagine as race I think to give a good example, we'll start with one that is at home in America. So if you go and look at the Native Americans, what you'll see is that a lot of people will talk about, oh, what's, what are we going to classify the Native Americans as? So historically, they'd be seen as sort of a Siberian people, which is like a modified version of the Asian people in general. When we go and look at them genetically, however, what we find is that the concept of the East Asian lineages for the women or the maternal co component of Native Americans, of course, men also carry that uh, maternal X chromosome. So the concept that they're uh, East Asian in that sense is correct. But when we get to the male side, most of Native American men are from a lineage called Q, the Y chromosome Q. And funny enough, the closest genetic link to the Y chromosome Q is the chromosomal group known as R. And R happens to be what most Western Europeans, Slavs, and a number of other people have. But as a general concept, the most broad use of it is in the Western Europeans, particularly amongst peoples who would be typically identified as Celtic. So the Welsh have the greatest amount, and then groups like the Irish and the Spanish and the English and uh, the French, Portuguese, these are groups that have tons and tons of the Y chromosomal group R. And also, the Native Americans actually happen to have a lot of the R uh, Y chromosomes as well. The In Canada, the second largest Native American tribe, the Ojibwe, actually have 60% R at the moment. It's been debated whether uh, this is a result of intermixing from Europe or whether these represent older lineages that were brought over in the first migrations. It's also worth mentioning that we do have two other sort of outlier groups. So a lot of Native Americans in like the northern part of the U.S. or Canada, they also have the Y chromosomal group C, which is a Siberian male group. It's just that it occurs at a frequency of, I believe, like 
15 to 20 percent so in other words is the distinctive minority of the men that have that and then if you go down to south america it becomes zero percent or zero to one percent of uh, c so a lot smaller groups that have that So the point though in saying that is that that's just a good example of how people would go and look at Native Americans and go and conclude, oh, they're entirely different from Europeans. Oh, they're just so much different. Well, the reality is that on the genetic level, they're very similar to Europeans in one sense and very different in another sense. So of course, Europeans have a different uh, maternal lineage. And even when we get into talk about what a European is, well, if we go to Greece, which is where the European, uh, the idea of Europe, uh, Europa, of course, is a Phoenician princess who went over to Greece and started the people of Europe in Greek mythology. So if we go and look at uh, Europe starting in Greece, what we find is that the Greeks are actually on the male side, North African. So they have the uh, genetic lineage E1b, which incidentally also the Lebanese and the Phoenicians most likely had. So this just goes to show you that the idea of going and forcing a extremely different lineage concept that would be white for the Greek and then non-white for the North African is entirely incorrect. And then if you're going to go and say, oh, the Greek is uh, white, then but the Greek is from an entirely different majorly different as you can see on the genetic tree here from the western european and then we go down to where the western european is well that post link with the native americans isn't the only thing that's actually a little bit abnormal if we go a little bit over to the left there we find the aborigines and papua new guineans very very different group those are groups that well historically what anthropologists from the west discovered them they were labeled as primitive caucasians but you'll see that they actually occur really far down that genetic tree incidentally just so you know how that genetic tree is determined basically the idea is that genetic genes will come and have very specific mutations on them so they'll have very different uh, genetic codes in that sense and so everyone will have the genetic mutations that are present in that group labeled A. So that A group is basically mostly the African bush tribes have that with the greatest amount of lineages. And then you have B there, and that's like the Bantu peoples or basically sub-Saharan Africans and uh, so on. And then you get a little farther down and that's where you start to get into the Eurasian group. You have certain places where those two groups are going to go and mingle together as far as the males are concerned. So Sudan and Egypt are very much like that, where they both actually, this is another odd one that you wouldn't look, know to uh, simply look at them. But if you go down to a place like the northern part of Sudan, almost all of the men there are not sub-Saharan in their lineage they're almost entirely of the eurasian lineages but most of the women are of the sub-saharan lineage so again the women also contribute a part to the men so the men have a y chromosome and x chromosome and the women have two x chromosomes so that's basically how that works and the point in saying all of this is simply that to go and biologically conclude that race exists well People have done that historically based upon how people look and how you know people might look similar or a different in different ways. So if you go and look at that group right next to the Greeks, you have D there. 
Now, the interesting part about D is that you can go and look in Asia, and there are a number of groups in Asia that have it, such as the Tibetans, the Japanese, I believe also the um, Nicobaran Islanders have it. And so those are all groups that are very Asian. And then the thing with Japan is that you then have the Ainu who have that lineage as well, but the Ainu have a very specific mutation that's unique to them, which else, which gives them more Caucasian appearance than most other groups that have that sort of lineage. So going back down to the bottom of our table there, and then at the far left side there, and oh, that's actually the East Asian lineages, the Northeast Asian lineages. So the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, this is the majority lineage that is contributing to them. saying all this is that as you can tell it's uh, our ideas of race are very different socially than what they are uh, reflected in in a biological reality i should also mention that this reality is also something that if you had done a extensive folklore appraisal you would have been able to sort of get the idea that certain groups were probably more closely related to one another than you may have otherwise expected so for example, some people who went and studied the um, Native American uh, folklore, they were coming away with the, I'm specifically thinking of um, a few authors that I read about the uh, Algonquin people. So those are the peoples of the Northeastern seaboard of the US and uh, Canada too as well. And so they were looking at their folklore and they were constantly coming up with these concepts that were similar to those of Viking folklore. Vikings once more having those uh, lineages associated with Western Europe. And so the idea is that, oh, well, now that we have similarities to Norse folklore, well, uh, how do we explain this? Well, maybe they went and adopted them from the Norse. Well, entirely incorrect. The, the Norse didn't even have contact with these specific groups. The Norse had contact with a now unfortunately extinct group called the Beotuk. And the Norse relationship with them was rarely friendly and certainly not the sort of thing that you're going to be sitting around and exchanging campfire stories with. <laughs> Basically, the Norse occasionally went and gathered resources from uh, Newfoundland where the Beotuk lived and then uh, they'd have forts that they'd build there and the Beotuk would either go and observe them the entire time, they'd occasionally trade together and a lot of the time it would break out into hostilities. So that's the end result of that sort of link and so yeah but then he's going and you know they're going and looking at native american folklore and they're going oh well we have like for example a bird that goes and flaps its wings a giant bird that causes the uh, winds to go and that's the same in this native american folklore as it is in the viking folklore and then they have their primary folklore hero goes and defeats frost giants so same thing again as the uh, norse folklore and then you have other links that are really interesting, like Native Americans having the same sort of words for power, magical power, as do the Polynesians. So the Polynesian concept of mana, and you'll find that basically like Matau uh, for the uh, Native Americans in the eastern parts of the U.S. So very close. And then the Native Americans also have concepts in certain tribes, like, for example... The physical color of magic being 
blue and then when you get magical powers your entire form goes this glowing glistening blue color which is of course the same sort of concept as you would see in india with their blue gods so very interesting just that's a good example of how stories can go and continue on even though we think that people are so different from one another just taking a quick look but those looks are very deceiving and in a lot of cases if people were to go and take a deeper look at each other's culture that they would be able to go and arrive at the fact that they have these sorts of links so let's go over just specifically how whiteness worked in the u.s because i think that is very important to go over so the u.s has of course famously had those sorts of large categories that it goes and puts people into so you have the black africans you have the native americans you have the asians and you have the white americans also nowadays you have the hispanics so the issue is that these are very much iffy in a lot of ways hispanic is a classic one because if you go down to the south american countries they basically combined Hispanic as being anyone who is like either has partly Native American lineage, but is also not culturally Native American. And then they combine that with just the European populations in those sorts of areas. So the Euro American populations. And so that then is broadly classified as being white Hispanic. So they basically merge those two things together and they just call them Hispanic and in reality, what that term Hispanic means is simply someone who is a part of Hispanic or Spanish culture. So the uh, Spanish culture that is basically the broad lineage of those people in South America. So that's what they regard as being Hispanic in most places in South and Central America. In North America, of course, in the U.S., there is this weird distinction that is made between non-white hispanics and hispanics and really what that's about is that there's a certain sort of hispanic person that is of course very um sent from the spanish or from the portuguese or italians however you wish to say that and then they are basically just white but they also have that little white hispanic moniker attached to them so again not something that really makes sense they typically just go into the broader classification of white in the popular mindset and then hispanic in the u.s the non-white hispanic is oftentimes associated with the sort of hispanic person whose lineages are probably mostly native american and so they have very much a native american appearance about them and so those groups are classified as non-white uh, hispanic so the in south america those two groups don't exist as separate groups they're combined together so the problem that we get into with how the word white went in the u.s is that it always had this sort of odd tendency to it because basically it was a bad thing for blacks and native americans in those again broader categories so we'll just go and be using those at the moment for uh, convenience just so you get what I'm talking about but basically the idea is that you have white and then it's sort of set in a separation against the black and the Native American and so during the time when the founding fathers were setting down the rules for America so they created the idea that whites and Native Americans cannot be enslaved by uh, white society but that whites can have blacks as their slaves and of course that is then overthrown in the u.s civil war where uh, blacks as slaves are eliminated and you now have the free black population the issue then is that there's some question about whether then white is then constructed as an identity solely for the purpose of acting as sort of an oppressive idea against the blacks and native americans this is partially what whiteness was constructed as but there is i think another point that we have to go and consider which is that's looking at it very much from the black and uh, native american perspectives now let's just go and look at 
whiteness as a concept coming from people who are migrating from Europe, from a bunch of different countries in Europe, and then they're coming to America. So the issue that you'll, of course, know about Europe is that Europe is famous for its various ethnic conflicts and then for its inter-country conflicts. There were a bunch of empires in Europe, and these places were constantly having wars with one another. And so in the U.S., they did not want to have wars like that, obviously. They want American society to be very much a place where people came and then merged together into oneness. And so that banner of white American is what all of those European groups that immigrated to America ended up assimilating into. So just instead of having the British American or the Scottish American or the English American, French American, German American, etc., Italian American, uh, the idea was to go and get everyone into the one sphere of the white American. And so even if practically speaking, you didn't want to go and call it white American. That was still what it generally meant. So there was one American identity for the general Europeans that went and assimilated into, and then there was going to be another sort of American for the black. So that is where you have the African American. So not exactly the best concept for social stability, which is the issue that constantly arose, right? Because in the era of the civil rights movement, Jim Crow laws, this sort of thing. The reality is that that identity that emerged as the white identity, then the black identity, those were getting played off against each other in conflict. And so the idea is, okay, so now instead of having these identities that are racial in nature, we're just going to go and remove them and basically have one American identity. And then uh, what then happens is that so instead of having a broad racial um, classification, then people then start to more identify as if they want to go and add a moniker, they go and add the ethnic group on top of it. So Black um, American, for those who don't know, or African American, more typically called, the reason why that is considered to be more of an ethnic group compared to the white is because it is a reconstruction of a general West African group. So that has come to America, that's been brought to um, America by mostly slave trade, and then has assimilated into one identity. So as the African American, which you also know, if you go and speak to immigrants from various African countries, they oftentimes more see themselves as being part of that sort of country cultural group rather than specifically being an African American. So Sudanese, for example, Sudanese Americans are uh, very much more considering themselves as part of the Sudan culture. Uh, Somalian Americans, too, uh, the various different cultures of Somalia. So the point in saying that is that that's perhaps why people go and have a little bit of a different appraisal of the African Americans, simply because African Americans are kind of a reconstructed group. And of course, um, if you want to go and see the vastly more further along form of that reconstruction, you can go and look at the various African Caribbean populations, so Afro-Caribbeans. And these are countries and groups that have essentially gone and done much more cultural reconstruction. And so they have a much stronger idea of what it means to be an African descent person in the Americas. And all this is important to take into account because to go further in society, the issue is that a lot of people want to go back to these old style of categories where you're playing ethnic groups against one another. And of course, in a place like Canada, for example, we've had entirely new groups that have come in that also throw out kind of an, a question about how they're classified. So historically speaking, when that term whiteness was you know conceived of you know, by anthropologists, the actual classification of it would include groups like the Middle East and Iran and Turkey. So those would all be groups that would be classified as being white. They'd be a variant sort of white. Um, I think North Africa, for example, was usually classified as being Mediterranean. So again, those are very 
um, unscientific concepts generally now, but that's just to say that back then people would have generally viewed things that way. You had India, which is another very interesting uh, discussion because, of course, in India, what the, the anthropologists went there and they determined that the people there were speaking uh, a language that was connected to the languages of Europe. And this is how we have the Indo-European group, the Indo-European language group. And specifically, the Indians are very connected to the various Iranian groups. So that then throws another spanner. Well, how do you classify these people? You know, they once again look different from the typical Caucasians in most cases, the Euro-Caucasians at least. And so in places that have had large groups of Indian immigrants, they were kind of also a part of this conversation about, okay, so what, where exactly do we fall in? You know, this whole idea of white seems to be becoming very complex. There was actually a court case early on in America where there were several Indian men who wanted to go and be classified as white Americans because they were, the idea was that they were descended from the Aryan people. That is, of course, another very um, controversial topic in India. We'll, maybe I'll address that in a, another video sometime. But the uh, general idea, of course, being at that time that you had the Aryans that are white and then they're uh, being set against the um, Dravidian groups, which are uh, basically kind of similar to the South, modern day South Indians. It's a false dichotomy. The Indians are uh, genetically not made up of that sort of distinction. But at that time, people didn't really look into it that much and they didn't quite have the genetic tools to see that that was a, a fallacious way of looking at India. And unfortunately, India, much like everywhere else, has suffered from that sort where people who want to go rabble rouse in southern parts of India and then go and claim that they're you know so different from the Aryans in the northern parts of India and it's just it's a bunch of nonsense that doesn't have any sort of uh, biological reality to it there's essentially it's just a matter of uh, appearances and people once more making too much of differences in appearances so all this is just to say that the problem is that the more people obsess about these ideas, the more you're going to go and produce the opposite of what you're going for. So if you go and constantly talk about whiteness, this, whiteness, that, whiteness, this, whiteness, that, and then you're going to go and socially act on that idea, you're going to go and produce a certain number of people who then go and identify more with that idea. So because you've gone and said, you are identified with this idea. We're going to go and treat you like you're identified with this idea. And so they're going to be identified with that idea no matter what. So if you have, for example, a university scholarship, let's say that goes and says you can't be white, you have to go and be a minority group to go and you'll have this. This is just going and ultimately propagating the idea that there's this sort of racial distinction that needs to be furthered in society. And the idea is that these people who are doing that, their idea is that they're going and lessening the distinctions between uh, people by doing that sort of thing. And then the reality is more that they're just going and expanding those distinctions by going and creating a hostile counter movement. So how we get out of this, of course, is well, for starters, we can talk about what needs to be done with the economy to go and make things fairer for everyone in a country. So this is one thing that is very important to go and sort of bring down those classes, not by being this sort of hard-nosed, oh, we're going to go and treat race and ethnicity like they're the be-all and the end-all of everything. Uh, we're going to go and look at everyone and say that if you're a part of this assigned group, we're going to say that you have this story. If you're part of this assigned group, you have this story. No, we're going to go and see people for what they actually are. So that's an important distinction there about how to go and about easing these issues. And then once more, just 
present people with the scientific facts that should be more than enough reality to go and get people to go and at least say that well maybe we're not so different with most people that's another good way of putting it and then yeah just i guess don't have the sort of neoplatonic attitude where you make reality the shadow of greater things and this is where fundamentally let's talk about the concept of where all this comes back to in greek philosophy they had this concept of the logos and of course you see this in christianity as well which calls jesus the logos and this means the word and so the idea is that this is the height of the abstraction where the abstraction goes and creates the world as a demonstration of its superiority over reality and it goes without saying that this is the sort of philosophy that all these sorts of movements are ultimately based around they do not think of themselves as based around it in this way but they are the philosophical lineage from this idea of reality has to be a shadow of a construct that we're going to go and interpret it through and this is one of the major things that must go we must be allow reality to be the interpreter we have to allow reality to be the one that interprets itself in human societies we necessarily require some abstraction but that is different from saying that we will allow just unfiltered abstraction without any sort of reality to it to go and be the guide of our society this is what is causing so much trouble in our societies and yeah that's just my point to you so we can talk about this idea of racial abolition but you should just be aware that if you're going to go and do that you have to go and make that as a reality you can't do it in this sort of a sense nowadays that just simply goes and perpetuates race simply as an abstract concept which is such an absurdity such an absurdity um what's more i i think that we should say that these people who have fully embraced this whole neoplatonic attitude are just very very foolish very very foolish indeed